Okay, so uh, today, uh, I'm going to forewarn you a little bit ahead of time because I did this and I told Darlene on the way over here. The Lord has given me half of it. He's given me the whole message. I know exactly what he once said in the first half, but the second half is kind of open, which he said that he will fulfill. So we're just going to let him do what he already does. So what I want you to do is I want you to take your Bibles and I want you to turn to John chapter 15. The title of this sermon is, They Will Know Us By His Love. Now, we sang the song, They Will Know That We Are Christians By Our Love, right? Well, the whole point of what God wants to say to us is that we, they will know us by His love. John chapter 15, we're going to look at verse number 12. John 15, verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. Now, what is interesting and what stands out the most to me and what the Lord showed me was this word commandment. This is my commandment. Now, when you think of a commandment, what are some of the things you think of? Something that absolutely has to be done without a shadow of a doubt is my commandment. Ugh, commandment, right? But in the Greek, there are literally four words for commandment. And we're going to go through all four of those words. The first word is diatogma. And it is an authoritative ordinance, mandate, or edict. Now, this word is only used one time in Scripture. It's used in Hebrews 11.23, and it is actually connected to the edict of the king of Egypt to kill all the firstborn children. So this commandment is an edict that has an evil connection to it. That is the first word for commandment. The second word for commandment is entalma. It is a religious precept of man. It's used three times in Scripture, and each time it is connected to a religious precept of man. I want you to turn to Colossians chapter 2 with me, please. I want to show you an example of this. Colossians chapter 2, verse 22. This will give you the, the example of this word. Colossians 2, verse 22. Which all refer to... Lighthouse rules. Lighthouse rules are in effect. Actually going to go, let's just go back to verse 21 that's really going to put it in its context so that we see it. Alright, Colossians 2 21. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with the using. Now watch. In accordance with the, that next word, commandments and teachings of men. Alright? So this second word is always connected to the religious teachings of men. Now, everybody understands, I'm praying, what the word religious means. The word religious is a set of rules you have to keep so that you can whatever. Okay? That's what religion is. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship. Okay? So we are not supposed to live our lives by the precepts of men. So when the men say, you must do this in order for this, you must do this in order for this, those are religious precepts, and that's what that word is connected to. So now let's look at number three. Number three, this word is the word epitage, and it is an authoritative command imposed upon someone. All right? This word is used seven times, I kid you not, seven times in Scripture, but it is always, always, always connected to the commandment of the eternal God. 
For an example of this, I would like you to turn to Titus chapter 1, verse 3. There it is. Thank you. Titus chapter 1, verse 3. One verse three, right? Oh, it is always connected to the commandment of the eternal God. <laughs> so what? So the first, the first word for commandment we saw is an evil edict. Okay, uh, sixteen twelve. The second commandment we saw connects to religious precepts of men. Okay, rules that you have to follow. Now, this third one is an authoritative command imposed upon someone, but it's always connected to the eternal God. Verse 3 of Titus chapter 1. But at the proper time manifested even his word, which is Jesus Christ, in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the, ready, commandment of God our Savior. Okay? So now... The first commandment we've seen is an evil edict. The second commandment we've seen is a religious precept by men. The third is, a, is an authoritative command imposed by God, but it's eternal. Okay? Now, there's one more word for commandment, and we're going to look at this next word. Number four is entole. Now, this word for commandment is a little bit different than the other three. How so? Because this word literally means an authoritative direction or commission. All right, it's the picture of this is what I'm telling you to do. Now go and do likewise. All right? The force of this word is that there is an authority in what is being said, but it is not imposed upon the person. Catch it? It's a little bit different. So. Whatever is being asked has the authority of the person saying it. Everybody connect to that? So that, this word is connected to that. Of these four words that you see on your paper, the one that Christ uses is not, number one, it's not the evil edict. Would Christ give us an evil edict? No. It's not number two. It's not a religious precept of man. Jesus is not telling you, hey, my commandment is to love one another. And if you don't love somebody, you're, going, you're not going to heaven. That would be a religious precept, okay? That's exactly what that means. The third one is an authoritative eat from the eternal God. Well, that seems to fit, right? But here's the thing. When you actually look at the word that's used here, it is the Greek word entole. A commission. Now, go back to John chapter 15 with me. And I want you to see something. What we're going to do is we're going to reread this passage, but we're going to insert that word commission in there instead. Alright? And remember what we say about the Word of God. You need to dig in to see what the words mean. Because if you just saw a commandment, you may have an idea of what you think a commandment is. You may think, oh, Jesus is saying you better do this or else. But that's not what he's saying. And you're actually going to see it in the tense of the verb when you actually look at how it's presented. Because when we think of command in Greek, what do we think of? An imperative, right? Guess what? That's not it. Twice he says this. Twice. But twice is not in the imperative. Huh? Because what? Come on. All right, here we go. So let's reread it. Here we go. John 15, verse 12. This is my commission to you. To do what? Love one another. Love one another. <laughs> now watch this. This is important. Love one another. Now, this term, love one another, all right, the commandment, is literally in the subjunctive. When you look at your Greek sheet, what does subjunctive mean? Subjunctive is a possibility. It's a probability, but it's not a certainty. So Jesus is literally saying, hey, I am commissioning you to go out and love one another. But the idea is 
there's a part that you have to play in that. In other words, he's not saying, if you don't go out there and you don't love your neighbor across the street who keeps yelling, then you are not going to make it into my heaven. That's not what he's saying at all. What he's saying is, as I'm commissioning you to go out into the world, love one another. Love one another. <laughs> Look again at the words for commandment. Only one of them is not imposed upon a person. It's the last one. He never imposes it upon somebody. And if that were not enough, Jesus adds a connector in verse 12. Love one another just as I have loved you. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, well, Jesus died for us. Do me a favor. Stop for just a second and recognize where we're at in the passage. John 15. Listen to me. Is Jesus dead yet? No. In John 15, is Jesus dead yet? No. See, make sure you step back and look and see exactly what Jesus is saying. Now, this is at the end of his life. This is at the end of his three-year ministry with his 12. And he's telling them, all of this stuff that we did together, all the times that you acted like a fool, but I forgave you, the bonds and the branches, which is right before that too, by the way. So what he's saying is, the time that we've spent together, I want you to love other people the same way that I did that to you. Now, was Jesus harsh at times? Yes. Was Jesus exacting at times? Yes. But was Jesus gentle? Always. Was Jesus forgiving? Always. Did Jesus have patience with the twelve? Peter especially, y'all. Always. Now, what does it mean then for me to love somebody? So if my commission is to love somebody, all right, now, and we see the fact that what Jesus is telling you here is this. Hey, as you're going out there, I want you to love somebody. But I know you're not going to do it all the time. So what does it mean to love somebody? Well, I want you to refer back. Because remember, there are four Greek words for love. And they're up here for you. This is kind of a recap of what we did our love study. The word love has four Greek words. There's phileo love, which is a friendship kind of love. Okay? You and I are friends. I love you in that way. We're out here. Alright? The second word is eros, which is a sexual kind of love, which a wife and a husband share. The third word is agape love. Now this word is up and above everything else. Because agape love is literally connected to God Almighty. In 1 John 4, 8, it says God is love. Now that word is agape love, but it's a noun. A noun is a person, place, or thing. God is love. So when you think about God, you must think about love. They're inseparable because that's God's character. Just like I am a man, God is love. It doesn't change. It doesn't fluctuate. Who we need to catch on to that? God's love doesn't fluctuate no matter what you do, good or bad. It doesn't change. Understand that God is always love. Always. Okay? So now, the last word is agape o. Looks very similar to the one before it, right? But there's an o on the end. What does that mean? It means it's a verb. Here's the connection. The verb meaning is to serve out of the foundation of the agape. So, when Jesus says love one another, he's saying agapeo. Because I can't agape because I'm not agape. But I have agape in me. That means that I can agape. Up. Everybody catch that? Now watch this. Jesus is telling me. Jesus is telling you. Jesus is telling all y'all folks. Listen. When you go out there, I want you to love. It's not a friendship kind of love. It's, it's obviously not a sexual kind of love. It cannot be agape love. But... It is taking agape and allowing agape to love through you. Uh-oh. So what does that mean? What are we getting to? Well, there's a point to this. And the point is this. You cannot love anyone in your own strength. 
Now listen, if there is a piece that the body of Christ needs to latch on to, it's this truth. Because we try to go out onto the streets and love people under our own strength. We say, oh, I'll buy this thing for them. But our heart is empty in giving them that thing. God's never told us to do a certain thing, but we're doing it anyway. Why? So that others can look on me and say, oh, he must be a very loving person. But what am I doing? Remember our relationship. Our relationship is with the Lord. God sees everything that we do, but not only does he see what he, we do, he sees the motive of our heart. That's the whole point. Now listen to me. Your flesh so wants you to be number one. On top of the world, everybody look at me. Woohoo! God gives grace to the humble. See, it is the humble person who loves. It is the humble person who lives this way. So it is literally impossible. Okay? It is literally impossible for you to love agape anyone. Well, then what in the world? There you go. So understand what we're seeing here. Okay? You cannot agape love anybody. You, in your strength, out of your flesh, you can't do it. It's impossible. So stop trying. The only way is to have agape love through you. Prove it. John 15, 5. Go up there. At the very end of the verse, what does it say? Apart from me, you can do pretty much anything you want to. You can do nothing. We don't catch on to that one either. We think, oh, I can do certain things. No, you can't do anything without God. What is he saying to me? Listen to me. Everybody take a deep breath in and release. Where'd that breath come from? God. He created the air. He created the earth that we stand on. He created the seats that you're sitting in. God created everything. It doesn't matter what it is. God created it all. And we can, yes, Okay? 
When I got to this part, he got real silent on me. But I know for a fact this is where he wants me to go, so let's go there. What is agape love? And how do I know this is agape love? Well, look at verse number four. Love. Stop. See verse four? What's the first word? Love. Guess what word that is? Yes? Lighthouse rules are in effect. 1 Corinthians 13. Y'all set? 1 Corinthians 13, 4. First word is? That is agape love. It's not agapeo. It's not phileo. It's agape. So now what did we say? Who is agape? Who? God. God. So now, everything else that you're going to read here is God. If God is love, and love is all of these things, then God is all of these things. Oh yeah, that's cool. Uh -huh. Listen very carefully to what I'm about to tell you. You are literally about to get a description of God Almighty. And now, all of these characters, please hear me. Please hear the heart of the Lord Jesus. All of these characters He wants to live through you. How many times have you heard another believer say, Ooh, I need to pray for patience. No, you don't. You don't need to pray for patience. You already have patience. How do I know that? Because Christ resides inside of me, right? Unless somehow I take Christ and I put Him on a pedestal, and then I say, oh, I need my patience today, so let me put Him on. Let me put Him in. No. By His doing, you are in Christ Jesus. So if you are in Christ Jesus, you have everything that you need. First Peter tells us that. Or Second Peter chapter 1. Verse 3. You, are, you are in Christ Jesus. You have everything that you need. So all of these things. Now listen to me. Because this is what the devil wants to do to you. He wants to tell you, you are so not patient. You are so not all these other things. You're just, it's just not you. It's just not who you are. Let's read through it. And then we're going to come back and unpack it. Unpack it. Love, agape, God is patient. Love is kind. Is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. We're going to hang out there for a little while too. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Who's the truth? Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Bears all things. Wow. Verse 6. Sorry. He just showed us. Rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love, agape, never fails. Listen to me, can God fail? No. Never. Okay? So now watch this. What, what does Paul do? In the very beginning of all this description, he says, God. And at the very end, he says, oh yeah, by the way, God can't fail. So everything that you see in here is a characteristic of God. And now what the devil has told you time and time again is, oh, you need to be like that. Am I lying? That's exactly what he tells us. You need to be that way. If you're not, then there must be something wrong with your salvation, right? Guess what that is? That is a religious precept of man. Oh, if I can do these things, then he's going to love me in return? Is that right? He already loves you. Thank you. God already loves you. He's never. He doesn't stop loving you. Even when you're down in the middle of the pit. Even before you were saved, he loved you. How do we know that? Because he died on the cross. Amen. But what about the people before the cross? He had died on the cross eternally, past. Amen. And it always happened. Understand, God has always loved you. Now listen to me. 
We need to flip this around because there are people out there who literally believe, there are brothers and sisters in Christ who literally believe, I have to do these things in order for God to love me. And then there are people out there who are unsaved and they think, surely God cannot love me because of the life that I live. Oh, you, you're, you've lost it. You've completely lost the whole point. Yes? That was the question that my dad asked my mother right before he got saved. Stop. He said, Helen, do you really think that Jesus would forgive someone like me? Well, guess what? Mom showed him out of the scripture. See the love of God literally played out in your life. So now, love. Agape love. Alright, now I want you to understand something. We are literally going to take a look. We're going to dive into each of these words. Number one, patient. God is patient. Patience means Enduring, temp even tempered when enduring trying circumstances. You don't need to get more patience. You have all you need. Why? Because God is these things. Now, I want you to pay attention. What is the what is the verb is? It's the same word for I am. Mean to be. God, I am patience. God literally is. Now watch, if I, if he is, has he ever not been? No. Is it based on a condition? No. Will he always be? Yes. God is patience. You are patient. See, somebody, it happened to somebody. The enemy just tried to say, no, you're not. You are patient. How do I know that? Because God resides inside you. You are patient. Oh, but I don't believe that. That's the problem. You are patient. When you allow God to live through you, when you allow a God they love to live through you, you are patient. Are you not? Can I get a witness? Patient. Absolutely. Every single one of you have been patient in a time when you're like, what? Next one. Kind. This is the word for warm-hearted, considerate, sympathetic. Now watch. Some people are kind as a means to an end. In other words, they are kind so that they can get something in return. That's not this kind of kind. This kind of kind is, I want to help you just because. God is always kind to us. You just did it a couple minutes ago. Y'all breathe in, y'all breathe out. That's God's kindness right there. The next. He's not jealous. Love is not jealous. God is not jealous. You are not jealous. Painfully wanting to have what, other ha what others have. Look, y'all, what does the world do? And they give you a bar to reach. And then when you get to that bar, you look up, there's another bar. And then when you get to that bar, there's another bar. And it's endless. It just keeps going. Yes. Exhibits self-importance. That's what it means to be both. Now listen to me. 
If anybody, anybody could be boastful, could it not be God? But what he's saying here is, I don't flaunt that I am. He merely says it. It's up to us to believe it. And then what happens? As we do believe it and we do live this life, we understand, wow, I have nothing to boast of because he is all in all. Paul said it this way, I got nothing to boast in, so I will boast in the Lord. I boast in him. But he doesn't sit up there going, look how good I am. No, God just is. He just is. Not arrogant. Connected to boastful. Meaning he's not prideful. God's not prideful about who he is. He just is. He does not act unbecomingly. That means to be improper. Uh-oh. All right, which one of you have acted unbecomingly this week? Right? <laughs> but here's the, here's the thing. When that happens, are you finished? You might as well just chalk it up. Well, if you've acted unbecomingly, then surely you're not of God. And if you're not of God, you're not saved. See how the, the enemy twists that around? That's a lie from the pit of Hades. You know what that acting unbecomingly came from? Your flesh. So what do you do? God, I acted unbecomingly. I knew that was wrong. Lord, I give that to you. I ask you to remove that from me. And done. Clean. Is it really that simple? Uh, yeah. That ain't it. You hear me? Because. Because. Why did you do that? God is love. He knows how. He knows how hard we struggle. He knows exactly how hard we struggle. He knows the people that we cannot stand. He was tempted at all points, like as we are yet without sin. Y'all, I know there's somebody in their mind, either watching or here, who's thinking, oh, that person. If I could just get along with them for five minutes. God wants you to love them. Amen. See, but he doesn't want you to do anything. He wants to love through you, and you're only going to do that if you surrender. That's exactly right. Satan's whole thing is to divide, y'all. And are we not seeing that clearly right now? Yes. Does not seek its own. That means to chase after what you want and you desire. Love is not provoked. Stirred up in one's emotions, feelings, and actions. Now, does the Bible say that God was provoked to anger? Yes, but you need to study what that word provoke means. It means that he got to a point where his patient said, enough. If I let this keep going, we're in a lot of trouble. Listen to me. Y'all who have had children understand this. I pray that there comes a time when they're like, you're like, oh, straw that broke the camel's back. It's time for me to lay down the law. If you don't, listen to me, if you allow your child to have whatever they want all the time, what kind of a child will that be when they grow up? They're going to be selfish, spoiled, and think that they want everything and they can get everything they want. Yes? Um, just to make that clear, I don't see it as in, um, I agree with what you're saying. I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying. It's patience. It's patience. It's patience. It's patience. Yes. Good way to put it. So it's patience in man, but it's perfect justice started. Everybody hear that? Because if his patience had an end, meaning that was it, done, finished, and he could never have patience again, then he can't be God. It's just like the believer at the judgment seat of Christ who is left without He's still saved. Say it again. He's still saved through the fire. But he doesn't lose everything. He's got a deal. What's your best Punishment is to grow us. Thank you. Thank you. Punishment is to learn your lesson. That's the whole idea of punishment. 
See, when we think about punishment, it is a bad thing that happens to us, right? Uh-uh. Punishment is literally to grow you. It's trying to tell you don't do that again. Now, does not seek his own. It's not provoked. Now, here's the next one. I want you to pay very close attention to this one. It does not hold a record of wrong. And that literally means to keep count of wrongs suffered. Build a tent or camp. How many times has something happened in your life and you've gone to the Lord and you've said, Lord, I confess this? And it may have been something bad, right? You've confessed it. Ask God for forgiveness. You know what the word says. But then a couple weeks later, the thought pops back in your head. Oh, do you remember when you did this? Yeah. I don't think God can forgive you for that. Listen to me. You point your finger in the enemy's face and you tell him, my God does not remember that. You do, because that's the only way that you can to trick me. But you know what? You go to Hades. Yeah. Understand what God is saying here. He holds no record of wrong. When you ask for forgiveness, it's done. It's the devil's job to try to keep bringing it back up on you. Why? Why would he waste his time? He wants you to feel condemned. He wants you to feel less than who he knows that you are. Do you hear me? He what? That's the devil's whole point. He's trying to trick you to think that you are not who you really are. You are a child of the Most High God. All of these characteristics reside in you. But if the devil can trick you to believe that you're not, well, you got to do these things. Ah, God. And you will live an unfruitful life, I promise you. I promise you. Yes. She said that he will do anything to steal your mindset. That's right. So understand that. Now, next thing. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness. All right? In other words, when you do mess up, because we all do, God doesn't look at you and go, ha, 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 ha. He also does not do this. Oh, that's okay. You can live that way. That's all right. Listen to me now. Sin is sin. The same sin that existed back in Genesis chapter 1 or 2 or 3 is the same sin today. Sin is disobedience to God, period. Period. Listen to me. What, what is society trying to do? Try to sugarcoat it. Oh, that's okay. God just wants you to do whatever you want to do because he loves you. See how the, the enemy even twists love? Oh, he wants you to have Eros love, so just do what you want to do. No. Sin is sin. I, I don't understand how people don't look at the scriptures and see what God clearly says about not inheriting the kingdom of heaven. If you act these ways, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. He's talking to believers first. Amen. First. If you do these sins, if you perpetually live in these sins, you are not going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. You can't stand before the judgment seat of Christ and say, well, brother so-and-so did it. Is brother so-and-so here with you right now? Uh, no. My word says, you're done. But now watch what it leads to next. Because this, and this is the one that God gave me on the spot. Rejoices with the truth. Now watch. Rejoices what? What's the next word? With. You ready for this? Enter into the joy of your master. What is that? 
It's your inheritance into the kingdom. Joy in the word of God is always connected to the kingdom. Always, always, always. So is hope. Because we're not hoping to go into heaven. Who's hoping to go to heaven? Thank you for not raising your hand because you've already got the ticket. And you can't lose the ticket. So, rejoices with the truth. Who is the truth? Watch this picture. Y'all, now I know why I did this. God is going to be glorified more than we could possibly imagine. But now listen to me. He, he, when he comes and he sets up his kingdom, he will rejoice. But listen to me. He wants you. He desires you. He loves you to rejoice with him. Amen. To him who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne. That is the picture. The rejoicing. This is all leading somewhere. Almost did the elk thing explode. Now watch this. Now watch how it turns. Watch how the words start to turn a little bit. It believes, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Those kind of sound, you know, like struggles. If the end result for you is your inheritance, what is God asking you to do? He wants you to struggle. He wants you to strive. Wait a minute. Why does God want me to struggle? Listen to me. The struggle is not picking up something. Carrying it around with me. I'm going to pull it. You got the bottle there, too. Good. Okay? This is not the picture that God would have for you. Let it go. Let, let it go. You understand what I'm saying to you? The whole point of striving is not to do stuff. The whole point of striving is to give up stuff. Is that not the hardest thing that we have to do in life? Right. Is to give up control? That's exactly what God wants. He wants you to give up control. Why? So you can rejoice with the truth. Yes. God will not fail you. Listen, 
He gave this to me this morning, but I know it's for more than just me. You ready? God loves you. God is with you. God will not let you fail. I'm going to say that again. God loves you. God is with you. Even if you can't feel it. God is with you. God will not let you fail. He will not let you fail. The only way that you fail is what? You give up. If you give up on Him, it's not Him that failed. You stopped. God will not fail you. Now, love is God through you. Okay? But listen to me. Now I'm going to flip the tapes. Love is also God to you. As we go through this list and you reread this list, I want you to understand, this is how God feels about you. He is patient with you. He is kind with you. He will hold no record of wrong. All of these things, this is what God is to you. But now watch. When you leave this place, we're going to meet people wherever we go, in, at work or wherever. Listen to me. God is just, if I can use the term, itching to love them through you. He's just itching to do it. All we have to do is say, I'm willing. That is hard, but it's the requirement. You have to be willing. You have to allow God to love somebody through you. Even if it makes you uncomfortable. Even if you don't want to. Why? Because your feelings will tell you, oh, you can't talk to that person. That would be awkward. Especially if you don't want to. Your feelings will tell you one thing, but are your feelings true? Listen to me. Never trust your feelings. Never trust your feelings. You trust God. You trust God. Don't trust your feelings. Because you're, now listen to me. Remember, we talked about this before. Miss Roxanne says, you know what? I don't feel like going to work anymore. She goes, stay at home, right? See what I'm saying? If you, if you, I don't feel like getting out of bed this morning. You're going to stay in bed all day long? Just because you don't feel that way, you get up. At some point, you're going to have to get up. That's right. You're going to have to get up. Or else you're going to stay there more. We're not going to talk about that. Yes. Read 14, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. 
Just the first three two words. What's it say? Somebody read it out. You know what that love is? Agape. Pursue God. Pursue God. Eagerly. Pursue God. Listen to me. What, what is he saying here? Out of all of these things, knowing what you know now about the God that resides inside of you, he wants you to pursue him. More and more. I know, that'll just blow your doors off, won't it? Amen. Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. The one who speaks in tongues does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. Y'all know that we've been called to speak the mystery of the kingdom, right? The word of the kingdom that most believers never see. We have the most incredible opportunity in life to allow agape to agapeo through us. All we need to do is be willing. Now listen to me. Whatever the hindrance is, I want you to go to the Lord with that hindrance because He already knows what it is. And I want you to give it to Him. It may be your shyness. I'm just going to tell you some of the things that I struggled with. My shyness, my, my security, what happens if I talk to this person and they pump me over the head? You know, all of these little things that come up that the enemy says, oh, don't, 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 don't. Whatever that is, give that to the Lord and listen to me. You're going to have a lot more of those, that was God, experiences. And what's going to happen? The wave will take you over. I guarantee it. Why? Because God doesn't fail. God doesn't fail. When He says a word, He doesn't fail. These things, He doesn't fail. Now, pursue God. Pursue God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for Your love that never changes. Your love that does not go up and down based on whether we do things right or we do things wrong. It's not a man's kind of love. It's none of that. It is a constant love that never changes and it never ends. We've been duped. We've been duped into believing that we have to live a certain way so that you'll love us more. But you showed us here today. That's a lot. You love us all the same. Your love never changes. You never change. God, these characteristics that are you, they, they're literally who you are. These characteristics reside in us. And Father, we are coming to you now. We're willing. Will you be willing? Will, 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 will you seek the Father's heart right now? Right now and say, I, I am willing. I am willing for you to love through me. I am willing, Lord, to lay my life down so that your life can come through. Are you willing? Will, will you do that? If so, I want you to I just want you to take a couple minutes and just talk to the Lord. Father, hear the prayers of you. Not just in here, but wherever this is being heard. Wherever a person is praying, Lord God, hear the heart of your people. They are willing for you to love through them. Father, I lay myself before you, and I am willing. All of the things that the devil says I cannot do, he's a liar. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My brothers and sisters in Christ can do all things through Christ who strengthens them. We are willing, Father. Now, Keep your promise, God. Because you said, I won't fail you. Keep your promise. For your glory. That's what it's all about. And I thank you, Father, and I praise you. And it's in Jesus Christ's magnificent, glorious, and holy name that we pray. 
And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen.